This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the niche details of modern warfare and underreported conflict with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to researcher Pierre Vaux and he's going to be talking to us about the far-right fascists that are currently fighting for Russia in Ukraine, ironically as part of Putin's denazification operation. The Kremlin narrative is that everyone who's defending their home from invasion in Ukraine is a Nazi and therefore Russia are the liberators. But actually, as we're going to hear, there's a very strong far-right openly fascist element to the Russian invasion, particularly the leadership within the DNR and the LNR, the separatist regions in the Donbass. If you like what we're doing here at Popular Front, please support us at patreon.com slash popular front. Okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of uh, preface this by saying before people go, but what about covering the far right in Ukraine? Um, People should go and check um, our podcast history. We've done several episodes on this even before the war. Um, And I've actually filmed with some of them as well in the past. So the idea that we don't cover that side of it as well is absolute bullshit. Um, But right now we're going to be covering... um, The far right element um, of, well, the Russian far right, essentially fascists from Russia fighting uh, in Ukraine, which is obviously ironic considering that Putin says that this whole brutal massacre and war that he's launched on Ukraine is a denazification effort, which anyone with a with a you know a brain in their head knows it's bullshit. Um but anyway, Pierre, let's let's I think I think before we get into what's happening um with the fascists from Russia fighting in Ukraine, um let's talk about the kind of far right neo Nazi fascist scene in Russia. A little bit of uh history if you can, because this goes back way before um Ukraine uh, before the invasion, right? Yeah. Um I mean a lot of the sort of fascist groups that are fighting in Ukraine have been involved in the Donbass conflict since the beginning, have roots that go back into the early 90s. Um, and it's important when you think about the fact that a lot of the fascists that came to prominence in the early days of the so-called DNR had actually been fighting as nationalists in Transnistria on the same side as some of the Ukrainian ultranationalists in UNA, UNSO. So they actually both fought against the Moldovans in that conflict and ended up on opposing sides later on in uh, Abkhazia and Chechnya and then the Donbass war. Mm. So it's there's a, there's a sort of a long family history there on the far right. I mean, in terms of post-Soviet far right stuff, the big emergence of a party that was kind of in the in the sort of mid eighties, uh, the first openly nationalistic fascistic party appeared, which was Pamyat, like mem- um, memorial memory, and Pamyat was very clearly authorized by the security services in Russia because up until that point you couldn't do any couldn't make any public expression in support of fascism or nationalism in the Soviet Union. And it was long suspected at the time that the KGB or the GRU were working with them in order to sort of channel any nationalist impulses into a controlled vector. And that's something that we saw over and over again in Russian history at the end of the Soviet Union. Um, and one of the most prominent members of Pamia at that point, and he, you know, he's been covered on Popular Front a number of times in various case and we'll not go too much into him but was alexander dugan well may- maybe explain who he is actually because believe it or not amongst the kind of um i'm so edgy esoteric instagram communists um he's actually really made a resurgence you know i got told by this fucking clown how great dugan was and i'm on the wrong side of history for thinking it's bad that russia completely invades ukraine um yeah maybe for our listeners that don't know like I know it's not completely um, relevant to the far right, but I think it is quite relevant to the far right in Russia, Um, you know, explaining who Dugin is. Yeah, so Dugin used, back in the 70s, Dugin was in sort of anti-Soviet circles, um, sort of very, very anti-communist far right actor that then suddenly pops up in the 80s and is allowed to do things, having previously been arrested for... um, criticism of the regime he's then 
pretty much behaves like an agent for quite a while and gets a job eventually teaching at the um what's it called the officers training academy for the ministry of defense but the thing so he's a he's a far right ideologue he's a proponent of this idea called eurasianism which is derived from they're actually quite a sad story derived from the sort of prison camp writings of Lev Gumilyov, who was actually Anna Akhmatova, the famous poet's son. Um, and while he was in the Gulag, he sort of spent a lot of time composing these largely fanciful histories of mm. Central Asia and Russia and you know the Scythians and all these sort of tribal groups. Very that was... like Hyperborea, right? <laughs> yeah, like it's not Maria quite. Type. It's not quite as mental as like uh, Evola and Hyperborea, which yeah. is always my favourite thing with Evola fans because it's like that's actually fucking mental. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's just completely made up history um, in which it's trying to sort of place the geography of the area as being critical to the path of history that it would follow. Dugin sort of took that and then applied a more high concept sort of political philosophy to it, yeah. but. It's kind of, it's a vehicle rather than a very coherent philosophy. The vehicle is, it's just a vehicle to which say that Russia is the most important country in the world and whatever, and its geography makes it inherently critical to the future of humanity and civilization. But what he's actually more influenced by and brought over a lot was fascism in Europe. So I think in 1991, he went to Paris and he met up with people like Alain de Benoit and this whole French scene from the New Right, like New Grèce, right, yeah. Le Groupement pour la Recherche de l'Etude de la Civilisation Européenne, which is like um, him, Dominique Venet, the guy who shot himself in Notre Dame, um, Emmanuel Leroy, Guillaume Fay, all of these people who get published by Arctos. Which, which is, yeah, a, a far right public, uh, a publishing house. Yes, which also publishes Dugan extensively. And yeah, I mean, Arctos is a very interesting subject in its own right, especially when you look in the money. Mm. But um, so Dugan is teaching, brings over Alain de Benoit to. The Russian Officers Academy, and as a as a guest lecturer, so he's actually teaching the future generations of Russian military officers these fascistic Eurasianist theories mixed with French New Right fascist ideology. Um, but he was a lot more interesting in the nineties than he is now. So he was involved in a lot of the sort of music scenes and stuff he was really obsessed with the band coil which which i love actually you know british industrial band he was doing sort of lots of alistair crowley um tribute stuff um and he was also playing for a bit with opposition politics and that's i mean again because it's all the setting of the scene but to put it into the context of 1993 which is like the most important year in many ways for what happened to Russia later on. So we had the constitutional crisis where Yeltsin lost his parliamentary backing. Yeah. And instead of, because the parliamentary groups that were opposing were a mixture of the communists and the nationalists, he was able to appeal to the West and got effectively US endorsement to put it down by force. But one of the groups that was very important in getting people to sort of rally behind them and come and assault the television station was uh, Russian National Unity, RNE, Rasiska Nazanali Yedinstve. And they are another one that stinks of being a state-controlled fascist group. They they were one of much more openly Nazi, so they would use the swastika. Yeah, um, They've changed it more recently to being more orthodox imagery to try and tone it down a bit. But they were leading people in a convoy of trucks to go to Ostankino away from the parliament. As they got near, they suddenly drive off. People then are left outside the parliament, outside the TV station, and that eventually results in the Ostankino massacre when the FSB opened fire on the crowd with heavy machine guns. Mm. That's where you know the British journalist Rory Peck was killed. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. and in, amazingly, at that point though. 
in the crowd there amongst the nationalist faction was Dugin and Limonov, um, Eduard Limonov, who would later found the National Bolshevik Party. Well, had already founded it at that point. Which is which is another fucking basket case of uh, ideologies. But yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah, so Dugin was like, he was either working for the state as a spoiler or was genuinely flirting with this seam of nationalist politics, but afterwards really seems to have gone to work for, gone back to working with the state after that. Um, I mean, lots of people will say things like, oh, he's, he's Putin's brain and stuff, which is rubbish. He has no major influence and it was putin when he was chair of moscow state university while, while putin was chair of moscow state dugan got sacked from his job because of the statements when he'd gone on his video and said kill 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 about ukrainians in 2014 so he's not an, an influence on putin but he is an amazing networking agent for links with the far right in europe um, also as a sort of emissary for international activities. Um, so as an example of that, really recently and relevant to a modern, a, a really recent conflict, in 2016, um, short, no, it was 2018, this was about a week or two after the, the revolution in Armenia that brought Pashinyan to power, yep. after all the street protests. Yep. So Dugin goes to a village that was captured by the Azerbaijanis in the Four Day War in 2016, with several MPs, some from the ill named, incredibly racist, fascist, liberal democratic party of Russia yeah. and United Russia, the governing party. Yeah. And he goes to this village, is fetid on Azerbaijani TV, and says, the position of the Russian Federation is that Nagorno-Karabakh is the territory of Azerbaijan. So he really drew his line in the sand there. Yeah, but like he's an he's a tool for when you want to send messages or make contact with people yeah, absolutely. that you don't necessarily that it's let it's a bit more awkward to do overtly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he's a, he's an interesting guy. Um yeah, I feel like there's so much to go into him and his like Western connections and his little like organizations that it, it would take, you know, a good few hours. We'd yeah. probably get sidetracked. Yes. But yeah. he's he's an important figure in the Russian far right, but I wouldn't actually and he's got a big network in Russia through groups like the Eurasian Youth Union, which did have chapters in Ukraine before the war, but they were pretty small. And he has broad reach of connections to people but i don't think his groups themselves are really the main ones active in paramilitary circles nor are they particularly ideologically influential online though he has a very big kind of following yeah especially in the west yeah that's the yeah. that's the the crazy thing and also he's got a good I know, I know we said I wouldn't go into the ties of it, but he's got interesting connections to people that perceive themselves as being on the left. So, you know, globalresearch.ca, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is yeah. like tanky Bible. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The founder of it, he's he was actually a member of the board of an Italian academic review, Geopolitica, alongside Dugin, years before um, global research came to prominence. They were. He's got good ties into international networks, and it, it's his influence on the international far right. I think so. There's like always a strong core of Duganists you know, online, particularly in Italy, and I'd say a bit in Spain and and um, in America. There's a lot. But the real sort of core of that seems to have been from his publications being translated and pushed by Arctos. Yeah. And Arctos was so... They really managed to cotton on very precisely onto that moment of the alt-right. Because that's when they had um, altright.com, which was a joint project of both Daniel Freebar from Arctos and um, what's his name? Nazi that got punched. Uh, uh, Richard Spencer. Yes. And Richard Spencer's wife, well, ex-wife, because he beat her and was charged over it, um, was the one who was translating Dugan for Arctos. Interesting. I didn't know. Yeah. That. It's, again, like, that. I feel like I'm worried about getting drawn too much into that, because, yeah, the Dugan 
the Dugin and Arctos network is mental in scale. So so let's go back to the Russian far right. Sorry, we're, we're talking about the history and we mentioned Dugin. Um, yeah, where are we going from there? From the early 90s, from the late 80s and early 90s, you get several major Russian fascist groups, which are all suspected within Russia of being curated by or certainly known and tolerated by the security services. And Pamya is one. And the other one is Russian National Unity, r &E, led by Alexander Barkashov. Um, and like I said, they're the ones who were quite open in using a vaguely Slavified swastika as their symbol. Yeah, like a um, No, not a Kovlera, actually. Like, much, still definitely recognisably a, a four-sided swastika. Ah, okay. <laughs> a bit more obvious then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were sort of big proponents of recreating, of sort of establishing Russian national power. The other factions were the monarchists, and a lot of them, they didn't necessarily have a single organised presence at that point, but you see them popping up in a lot of conflicts, like Transnistria again. Um, so, for example, Igor Girkin, known as Strelkov, who would later become commander of the armed forces of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, he fought in Transnistria alongside Alexander Borodai, who would become the first prime minister of the DNR. Um, and at that point, Borodai either was or would shortly end up becoming an editor of Zavtra, which is a far-right newspaper run by another Russian ultranationalist called Alexander Prakhanov. Mm. Um, and then after Zavtra, which means tomorrow, there was an TV, online TV channel called Dien Day, which was also hosted by Baradai um, and would feature a lot of his former friends from the sort of spook slash nationalist nexus in Transnistria. Um, and then the other one is, again, in terms of nationalist groups, is the National Bolshevik Party at that point, who were led by Edward Limonov, who was as oh, he's a fascinating individual. Um, and he was quite lionized in the West, particularly as a result of, you know, his hyping by publications like The Exile. Um so in the 80s, he'd actually lived as an emigre in New York. He'd been involved in the punk scene. He was writing in English. He was quite he was quite an interesting person and then moved back to Russia and founded a party whose ideology is pretty much like the commie Nazis in McBain and the Simpsons. Right, um, yeah, yeah. Down to like having a flag, which is sort of a red flag with a white circle, but then with a hammer and sickle in the middle. And national Bolshevism often manages to get def often get some defenders you know due to its sort of left wing symbolism but it it's fascist and it's yeah. ragingly anti-semitic um which is you know a core part of all of these ideologies and especially with the monarchist scene as well um the the russian sort of monarchist neo-imperialists are incredibly anti-semitic yeah. because they believe that the bolshevik revolution was an act of jewry inflicted on russia rather than a domestic revolution Jesus Christ. yeah it's it's, <laughs> it's really yeah. it's really depressing stuff to have to read lots of mm. um i mean there's lots of other little fascist group of skills that pop up here and there and neo-nazi scene which develops kind of parallel to that but i think those four tendencies um are the ones that are really important when thinking of the war in ukraine there's there's also um there's also something i wanted to go over as well briefly i know it's not as relevant to the war in ukraine but there was a time i think in like 2016 or 2006 rather um i might have the dates wrong there I forget but a time when these there was literally like um neo-nazi serial killer gangs like uh i think they're called the cleaners sanitaire 88 um, and then there was also that that kind of notorious video of um, a neo-Nazi cutting off uh, the head of, I think, uh, uh, what he thought was a Romanian immigrant, but he was actually a, a Russian from, I don't know, Siberia or something. Um, and there were, and then there, there was also like you know a lot of um, uh, what's his name, Tasak, you know, the the neo Tesak, yeah, like that whole scene was kind of after all that stuff, right? Yeah, that kind of emerged later on as a. 
the thing is that there was there were periods when even the Kremlin was kind of backing some of the more extreme overtly Nazi groups. So through Tsurkov, Vladislav Tsurkov, who was for a long time, no longer is, but for a long time was kind of uh, one of the main sort of movers and manipulators within the presidential administration in Russia. He was, according to the trial, you know, according to the people who were con convicted, was in his office was having meetings with members of a group called Born, um, like which translates as like combat organization of Russian nationalists. Mm. And they're the ones they were involved in the assassination of um, Stanislav Markalov and Anastasia Barbarova in um, working for Nova Gazeta in was it two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. Um, so there was there was play. There was some play with from the authorities with these sort of proper Nazi violent groups because they were useful. They could be turned on the opposition. They were tolerated. But at the same time, some of the tendencies in that, like the Russian March, which is a big sort of broad church gathering of neo-Nazi and fascist groups across the spectrum, um, they used to sort of do a lot of anti-immigrant attacks and like going around and attacking, attacking sort of people from Central Asia in particular. Those those groupings were slightly more pro problematic, I think, for the government. The police were clearly happy to tolerate them and collaborate with them in some areas. Um, but then at other times it didn't work with the messaging from the Kremlin at that point. Well, there, there's a really interesting um, documentary called Credit for Murder about all of that, that whole neo-Nazi serial killer murder scene. Um in, in Russia, particularly, I think, St. Petersburg and Moscow. And he does a lot of investigative work into it. It's very, very good. Um, and it seems that, you know, like you said, like the, the Russian, like Putin himself was very, very closely aligned uh, with a lot of this stuff. Uh, and it was very easy for the SBU to kind of help Putin with his election results again by saying, look, I've took these neo-Nazis off the streets, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, and, you know, when they looked into it, it were, I mean, even other neo-Nazi groups that were outside the sphere of their SBU influence were like, yeah, those guys are from the government. They never get arrested. They're allowed to do whatever whilst we're getting clamped down on. You know what I mean? It was very interesting documentary, Credit for Murder. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think to bring it up, Closer to the thing. So that's the that's the interesting thing with the groups and even their paramilitary wings of how tolerated they are. So both the national Bolsheviks, um, who are now known as Drugaya Russia, Other Russia, um, they've renamed themselves and they use a slightly different symbol now with the hand grenade and the lightning flash. Mm. They are both them and Russian Imperial Movement, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute in terms of where they came from and their history connections. They're both anti-government in terms of their public statements. They're yeah, both they're very right? critical of the Kremlin and the Putin regime. Mm. However, and they both have sent paramilitaries to fight on the side of the Russian forces in Ukraine. However, Drugaya Russia guys have regularly been arrested and, for example, their paramilitaries returning from the Donbass were picked up and charged. Whereas the Russian Imperial Movement guys actually get state backing, mm. um, which we can, we'll can we talk about in a little while for their stuff in Petersburg. Yeah, yeah. That well, so, so the Russian Imperial Movement is one of the bigger ones, right? I think just before the war, the couple of months before the war, the invasion, um, they were actually designated as like, I don't know, a terror group or something by the US. Um, yeah, let, let, let's talk about that. Yeah, so Russian Imperial Movement began in around between 2002 and 2005, depending on which version of their internal history you find. They're hardcore monarchists and really, really anti-Semitic. Mm. Um, they believe in the duty to restore the glory of the pre-1917 Russian Empire. Um, so they use the Russian Imperial insignia and flag, the double-headed eagle, um, again, like I said earlier, very, very specific like equation of Bolshevism with 
Jews and this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, which is really popular in the far right, beyond just them, of the communist revolution being somehow a Jewish plot against Russia. Mm. Um, like you saw, do you remember that guy, Alec, Charles Bowman from Russia Insider? No. Oh, they were an awful, he's like this American expat guy that runs this horrific, like it used to just be like a sort of Russia apology website. And then after, at a certain point, a couple of years ago, he suddenly went completely mask off, like raging anti-Semite. Right, right. Um, and now has articles from written by Eric Stryker and all these other people. Oh, Jesus, right. So actual like, <laughs> far right fascist people. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, he's a, he's a big proponent of this idea and it, it's really common in, in those sort of Nazi circles, this like, idea that communism was this uh, Jewish plot. Mm. So Russian imperial movement, it's led by a guy called Stanislav Vorobyev. Um, and the interesting thing with him is that he's actually quite good at sort of the international networking side of it so he's built starting quite early on really close relationship with nordic resistance movement in sweden yeah and like he was going to he went and attended one of their big conferences these sort of annual summer retreats and did a speech there and they co-published some stuff but then what emerged a short while, what emerged a couple of years later was two guys from Nordic resistance movement, Anton Tulin and um, I can't remember the other guy's name. They went over to a training camp outside Petersburg run by Russian imperial movement. Um, and a short while later, after returning from this training camp, they carried out a series of bombings in Gothenburg, mm. targeting um, refugee center, um, a sort of cafe that was associated with left-wingers and anarchists. Um, they injured several people. I, I can't remember. I don't think anyone was killed, but it was a proper serious campaign of bombing. And Swedish prosecutors do argue that they were trained in how to make explosives at this camp. Yeah. It's called Partisan Centre outside Petersburg. Yeah. But what's amazing with Partisan Centre is that it's actually run by, uh, it's actually got a parent company to it, which is um, called Reserve Drujina, like Reserve Militia. And even though Russian imperial movement rant and rage about the Russian government and say it's actually, you know, Putin is a traitorous puppet of the West and he's really controlled by the international globalists, blah, blah, blah. Reserve Drujina, the parent company of Partisan Center, was actually an officially registered militia with the St. Pet Petersburg City Administration, which meant they had like... Government approved, essentially. Yeah, they had for a while. Basically, this was a thing that Putin reintroduced um, 2013 or so, where Drujiniki, like these militia, volunteer militia associations, could take on sort of quasi-police type rights to you know, act as deputies to help the police or beat up immigrants or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah, Reserve Drujina got that approval from Petersburg City Administration, who then publicly backtracked out of it when they got sort of called out about it in the press. Mm. But they were also a member, sent, they were also a sent, the centre was listed as a member of DOSAF, which is this other quasi-state association of, like, military veterans and patriotic education and stuff um so they were they've got this sort of tacit approval well not tacit explicit approval by the state to carry on and they've been reported on their activity for years everyone knows what they're doing and the groups they've had over there for training are i mean they had members of the Dritte Wey, um, Junger Nationalisten, which is the youth wing of Germany's NPD, neo-Nazi party, um, several, a whole load of people going over there. Oh, by the way, not, as has been reported in some places, Caleb Cole for, from Attenboffen. Yeah. For some reason, that got into some Argentinian paper and then Stanford University's terrorism website picked it up. And it's like, I... You've done loads on Atom yeah. like I talked about this with Ali as well. I've spent ages researching Partisan Centre. He never went there. There's yeah, no yeah. evidence. I think he probably wanted to, but you know, he never went there. Yeah. 
like I, uh, there's no record whatsoever of him flying there and doing that um so they got this it's like a building with an outdoor training range and an indoor space with built built up rooms for doing breach training and house to house fighting um they get trolled with assault rifles and so on and yeah this place is completely able to function but the other thing that's interesting is it's run so the reserve reserve Drugina is the company that runs it but the actual guy in charge of it this guy denis gariev is also the commander of a thing called the imperial legion which is their proper paramilitary unit right um and what's really interesting about them is when you look at their vk you know for contact your profile and you look at where they report their dead it's interesting where it lines up so at first it looks like they're standard russian nationalist militias fighting in ukraine so they had lots of casualties in the baltsova um in early 2015 which was the sort of the last really big offensive of the sort of original donbass war when even after the russians had signed the minsk agreement well not the russians the russians proxies had signed the Minsk agreement for ceasefire they then assaulted the Baltzava, this big city in the Donetsk region and captured it yeah they suffered loads of casualties there um but they also suffered lots of casualties in Tripoli in 2019 maybe. and 2020 yeah what were they doing there <laughs> well that's the thing and it's there was another one where when i think it was a washington post story where they reported on they found russian military training manual found outside found outside tripoli but it was a it was a case of burying the lead because they didn't read what it said in russian on the front of it huge font which was russian imperial movement right i mean my suspicion is that they're effectively like muscle for wagner yeah because we know that there was loads of like white supremacist graffiti found in Libya, where Wagner obviously had been deployed. Um, there's their deaths, and all because the Baltzava was the first big operation of Wagner, where survivors of that told Russian journalists investigating that they'd done human wave attacks and it was a disaster. And you see this like syn synchronization of where Russian imperial movement guys die is also where wagner forces go on bad missions so i think it's beyond it's even not just a case of their like toleration or like in, you know involvement by the state at a low level they are actually working for wagner which is gru yeah as their for as their sort of a big chunk of their forces are these fascists um and in terms of the um the fascist militias in the Donbass. Um, there's quite a few of them, right? I remember there's that guy, I think they call him like the uh, the Donbass lunatic. He was the guy that was like, he like killed a puppy and stuff like this. Yeah, Milchakov. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we did a, we did a bonus episode about him. Fucking lunatic. Yeah, well, Milchakov was actually a guest of Russian Imperial Movement when they did their big international conservative conference in 2017 with um rodina as well the mm -hmm. other sort of big far-right party and yeah milchikov was fated by them um i mean milchikov to give history of milchikov um he was in Dershaga, a like a paratrooper assault unit rusich which used to be part of a unit commanded by a guy named alexander birnov batman as his nom de guerre who was assassinated in mysterious circumstances in 20, late 2014. Um, Gierkin, ironically, actually accused it, has always accused Wagner of being behind his assassination, um, enabling Rusic to sort of emerge from that. They were then, de he's, I mean, he's an outright Nazi. Yeah, he says it. There's an interview where he's like, no, I am a Nazi. Like, yeah, it's fucked up. You know, I mean, so there was the big, the, they filmed themselves uh, after a sort of ambush on a Ukrainian convoy near Metalist outside Luhansk in 2014. Um, and one of the guys who was on the ground there, um, you can see that they've like carved a, a kovlerat into his face. Yeah. One of you. That guy, by the way, 
was identified by his family as a Ukrainian soldier named Ivan Isak. And he's the same one who doesn't, who appears like he's injured and he's got a thing carved in his face. Then a few weeks later, he gives an interview and gives his name. Well, he doesn't give an interview. He is filmed by Graham Phillips, the British pro Russian propagandist. Yeah. But at this point, he's completely covered head to toe in burns on a hospital bed. Mm. Um, he died a short while later and his body was returned to his family um, with like a, fl- a piece of blue and yellow fl- cloth stuffed in his mouth. Jesus Christ. He, yeah, so Rusic captured this guy, tortured him, set him on fire, and then he was placed in front of Graham Phillips to be interviewed, inverted commas, before dying. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, Rusic, Milchikov is not a yeah, horrible individual. He's um he and out there, right? Yeah, yeah. He's he's in combat in Ukraine at the moment. Yeah. Um, but he was also again connected to Wagner, and by that I mean he was posting photos of himself at a site which was actually an oil installation. Um, I think it was in Deir ez Governor in Syria. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same oil installation that that video that I'm sure you've seen the really horrific one where the Wagner guys are breaking a Syrian man's legs with a sledgehammer and mm. there's severed heads around. Yeah. That's the yeah. same place. Yeah. <clears throat> so milchikov has been present in a lot of these places at the same time. But yeah, they he's gone back into Ukraine with Rusic. They've got, I think, in between his... Rusic period from 2014-15 and his re-emergence in U- in Syria, he was actually in the Russian Airborne Forces for a while, the VDV, because he was posting photos of himself at a VDV training camp. Um, and I think him and his friend Jan Petrovsky, um, who was a Norwegian resident but got deported, um, uh, known as Veliki Slavyan as well. Um, I think they're both they both did a VD some time in a VDV unit, or at least a training course by them before being returned. Yeah. It's the the problem is the in, how to separate these units. Like Rusic now seems to be going in alongside Wagner, um, and the, the, obviously Wagner isn't really a group in its own right. Wagner is like a network of contracts to mask Russian military presences in places. So. These like little subcontracts make it really hard to establish what unit is a structure in its own right, or if it's just a brand that's tied to certain people in order to sort of give a particular effect in an area. Yeah. We can say, or okay, from their own words and from open source material like tracking, geolocating where photos are taken, in terms of the units that are fighting in Ukraine right now, we can say that. There's Rusic, 100%. We know that they were active um, in sort of Kharkiv Oblast. There is Russian Imperial Movement, and that's because they've posted lots of stories about their deployment, and they were actually in Izium. They said they had a base near, not far outside it and that they were fighting in the withdrawal from it when the Ukrainians recaptured it. Um, and that's perhaps worth bearing in mind because Izium is also where they found lots of mass graves. Yeah. Um, we know that another unit called Bars 13 Russian Legion, which is a volunteer unit, and it seems fairly ragtag in terms of their equipment, but at least to the leader of it, um, who's this guy called Sergei Fomchenkov, is a former member and like high, fairly high profile member of the National Bolshevik Party, Andrew Gaia Rossiya. Um, and so you actually see things like they've been featured in quite a lot of Russian propaganda recently, um, particularly from Sasha Kotz and a guy called Simeon Pegov, who's known as War Gonzo, who used to work for Life News. Yeah. And propaganda. in his interviews, he's even been wearing a Drugaya Rossiya patch on his plate carrier while promoting these guys we know that from that stuff that they were in liman until very recently which the ukrainians have just recaptured as well so we, we've got like several of these units pinned down 
in the area and we you know we can sort of eventually look at tracing back where they've been and what they've been up to in those places um but they are yeah it's a surprisingly big presence considering until in the early stage of this 2022 war it was actually quite different to the 2014 2015 period so it's much less ragtag it was much more uh, you know, Russian regular troops were being used, obviously without any proxies. And it took a while for us to see these groups come out. But now we've got to the point where they're reconscripting prisoners and doing mass mobilization. They're desperate for any warm bodies. And they're quite happy to showcase the fascist sub factions fighting for them. But right. I mean, with, I was going to say, like, in terms of the Donbass, it's really important to bear in mind. It's been open. There's been high-profile fascist individuals involved in the in the Russian intervention in Ukraine since the very beginning. Yeah. So, the first guy who was one of the first separatists who rose to prominence was a guy called Pavel Gubaryev, and he was a former member of Russian National Unity. You can see him in his paramilitary uniform in old photos and doing a Hitler salute. A Borodai, who was the first prime minister of the DNR, is you know, editor of a Russian ultra-nationalist website and former writer for Zavtra. You've then got Girkin, who's a raging far-right monarchist. And yet at that point, you had all these people who bought into the iconography looking kind of neo-Soviet and thinking, because it's called a People's Republic, it's a left-wing project, even though the People's Mayor, Prime Minister, and, like, our commander of the armed forces are all open fascists. Well, there's a really funny image recently of um, uh, that guy, the clown that runs the D well runs the DNR, giving um, a medal to one of the Rushit guys, and the guy had like an SS death skull or some shit, like a patch on his thing. Um, and it's like, well, yeah, well, uh, how, how is that guy? You know, this guy is clearly a Nazi. Yeah, it's not. It's. I mean, I think a big part of this is within Russia the the idea of what a fascist is is not really related to what you and I would talk about as fascism as a political concept. Right. So there's not... If you Okay, so in World War II, when you had writers going over and uh, Russian, Russian Soviet forces like first uncovering evidence of the Holocaust, and one of the writers who was working for a Russian military paper at that point uh, Vasily Grossman, who wrote books like Life and Fate and um, Everything Flows, he reported on all of this and effectively was shut down and was uh, was censored because it was it was considered politically unacceptable to highlight that fascism was specifically anti-Semitic and that there was a specific racial hatred aspect to it because no fascism is just awful to you know, every it's just an enemy of Russia. Right. It's what's it's anything that is against us is fascist, but fascism doesn't actually have its own ideological or racist characteristics in that sort of Soviet version of history. Right. It's just everything I don't like is fascism. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of and ideas. it's and he was he was completely you know seriously suppressed for that. And it's around yeah, the same yeah, time you yeah. got you know um, Shlomo Levy from the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, who the Russians had used allowed to sort of use him use his speeches and stuff to try and get support against the nazis but then the nkvd or i guess it was maybe ogpu not nkvd tight took him out one night in poland and after they were sort of pushing the germans out and tied him up on the side of the road and drove over him with a car repeatedly and then said he'd had a car accident yeah like they were there's no it's it it's not the idea, all of the de the declarations are like this is a denazification, a war against Ukrainian fascism, and so on, so on, so forth. It's not about fascism as an ideology. They're not doing like a serious critique of like, oh crap, actually there are aspects of Ukrainian politics, you know, with the Azov and groups like Tradizia Poryadok that they're worrying about. They're not talking about that. It's just a placeholder of the enemy. And how do they? Um... When, when they send these kind of the, the far right, the fascist groups from Russia, when they get sent to um, to fight for Putin, essentially, 
uh, and they seem very happy to go and fight. Don't get me wrong. A lot of them gone themselves. How do they then like justify that in their kind of outward, you know, their media? Because obviously they're not meant to be fighting for this guy that they've said they've hated for the last, you know, however many years. Yeah, that's what's always... So they seem to think that this war was inevitable and that this war, they still stick to the general boilerplate that this is a war to defend the people of Novorossiya against um, Ukrainian sort of punitive forces and the American globalist Jewish NATO cabal. Right. And they think that their war is existential and that it's justified. They think they are, they regularly accuse Putin of betraying the war effort by failing to sufficiently devastate Ukraine in the opening weeks of the war and that it's his fault that the war has been such a disaster for the Russian armed forces. Uh, yeah, actually, I saw a thing recently where they were like, um, I don't, it, actually, it wasn't even, it like, it wasn't even, um, well, yeah, I mean, I would say definitely far right in her ideology, but it's one of the head people from uh, Russia today being like, why can't we just nuke everybody or something? Like, she's like, I don't get it. Why can't we just commit more massacres? It's like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah, well, I mean, some of the channels that Russian, so I mean, even the channels on Telegram that are, they're not state run overtly, but they're promoted by things like Russian diplomatic accounts and stuff. Yeah. Like this one, um, it's in English called uh, Rokot. And it's they posted a few weeks ago just an open sort of advocacy for war crimes. Yeah. Um, they were like, oh, well, in the winter war with Finland, you know, there was this, the, fin the Finns massacred several like Russian troops and didn't take prisoners. But this plucky commander raided a Finnish hospital and murdered everyone there. And then they didn't fight, carry out any more massacres of our troops. This is what we should do in the Donbass. And they even used another example claiming that that aforementioned fucking horrible video from Syria of them torture, you know, murdering a guy with sledgehammers yeah. was supposedly a, a move to like, it supposedly had been effective in stopping ISIS from killing and mutilating Russian soldiers after that point. Was it? Fuck. Mad. Madness. Yeah. And they were just openly advocating like, we need to do this in Ukraine. Yeah. Jesus. Like kill everyone in a hospital or torture someone on video, I, and these guys like Imperial Movement, for example, they they really were for a while doing quite well at wiggling their way into the West, despite all of this sort of rampant extremism and connections to paramilitary stuff. Mm. Like you said, that they got prescribed by the State Department as a global terrorist organization at the beginning of 2020. Just a couple of months before that, in December. In 2019, in Spain, they'd been at a conference in Madrid where they were sitting. Their representative, this guy Stanislav Shevchuk, was sitting at a table with Nick Griffin and Roberto Fiori, leader of Forza Nuova. Oh, they're a real Nazi. Group. Yeah, like leader. I mean, for non-Brits, like Nick Griffin, leader of the British National Party, like sort of the probably the most high-profile neo-Nazi politician in the UK. Yeah. Um, even if he's not that important anymore, but he's like a proper Russian stooge. Yeah, oh, completely. Yeah, he was having a go at me on Twitter. He's like, "Shut up, you fucking daft cunt." He's like, "He's like, oh, what do you know about? Have you ever been to Ukraine?" I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> ten times, you fucking idiot." Like, it's very odd. Like, a lot of them base it all on their interactions with these other fascist kind of. Um, I don't even know what you would call them, like ideologues that are like traveling across Europe talking shit about this, that and the other. The thing that I find weird though, like how how do then, <clears throat> how do these um, far right groups in Russia that fight for Russia and fight against Ukraine, what do they say about far right groups that are fighting for Ukraine? Well, that's the interesting thing is that a lot, like I said, a lot of them used to have be on the same side in Transnistria and even yeah. personnel wise, you know, um, Olina Seminyaka, who's the, she's the, I don't know if she still is, I think she might have departed from it now, but for a long time she was the sort of press secretary for Azov, yeah, yeah Azov National Corps. Mm. She used to be in kind of some of the same, like she was never close to him, but she was right, you know, went to conference, she was invited to conferences, um, went to a big conference in Moscow and met with Dugin. Um, she was also were doing some stuff with Troy Southgate in the UK, who was also doing stuff with Dugan at the same time. 
a lot of those Ukrainian fascist parties all used to be quite happily in the same club yeah, with all of the yeah. Eurofash ones that are allied to Russia. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of Western media attention went on to, and it's real, the, the fact that, that Svoboda and Azov, Azov in particular, after the outbreak of the war in 2014, made a huge effort to network and build all these contacts in Europe. But it's not because they were doing that because like, oh my God, this is an emerging new threat. It's like, that's what fascist groups do. That's yeah, what they've yeah, always done. Yeah. It's just they lost all their connections they had before through parties like Svoboda and Patriot of Ukraine. Because yeah. up until that point, Svoboda, who are, I mean, they're again, much less relevant in Ukrainian politics than they used to be, a big far-right party. They used to be sort of quite matey with the Front National in France, who are, of course, hardcore aligned with the Kremlin nowadays. So it's, yeah, they, they, it was all in the same club. It's weird though. If if you bring this up now, you get you get fucking shouted down by like U.S. like boomers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're like, no, no, it's not true. It's like, mate, I've done like fucking like eight years research on this. You know, every fucking country has a problem with this, whether it's big or small, and it it fucking existed. Like, the, the, it's like go and look for yourself. Okay, things have changed now. This, that, and the other. Yes, we're not saying like the whole of Ukraine are Nazis. They won less than three percent of the fucking vote, but there is definitely <laughs> there, that existed, whether you like it or not. You know. Yeah, I, I I know I know, and it's. I bet you get it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's going to be it's going to be a very interesting dynamic long term. I mean, I think domestically now, because as of have they really have fought incredibly well, and in Mariupol they're going to be beyond reproach for a long time. I no. think domestically, no one's going to be wanting to have that conversation. Um. I mean, the the interesting thing is that there are still people in the far right scene in Ukraine who are actually from Russia in the first place, from the far right scene there. Yeah. So with Azov, a lot of the, again, not so much now, but in the early period, a lot of the people who were quite influ quite prominent were members of Misanthropic Division, which is Russian. Have you ever fully worked out what Misanthropic Division is? I, it seemed to be a very online Nazi presence, but then they were involved in some street in like some like street activity. Well, I I was seeing Misanthropic Division flags before Azov flags on the front line. They're definitely yeah. older. Yeah, but they're heavily linked because when I when I did my documentary um about the the Azov training camps for the kids in like I don't know fuck me like 2017, um yeah. a lot of the parents that brought their kids were wearing Misanthropic Division t shirts. Yeah, there was a it's fucking grim in a way, but like. Kind of absurd. There was a misanthropic division front group called Green Line Front. Did you ever look at them? Yeah, vaguely. It was like eco types. Yeah, and they'd do all this like animal liberation stuff in Russia. But then they came to Ukraine and they were organizing in a kids' school in Chernobyl. They did three sessions. It was clearly like some teacher at the school was matey with one of them, and they got covered in local press. These like, oh, we're going to gather bird feed a bird box building competition for the kids or they do like gathering you know we'll go out and do woodland conservation work with the community but then the rewards for the kids building the bird boxes were like awesome oh, chocolate and a little certificate with a black sun on it yeah as you do <laughs> but they even went to like battersea dogs home fucking hell they sent a delegation led by this italian neo-nazi um francesco fontana um, and he was the one who was actually linked up with National Action as well. British neo-Nazi group. Yeah, he's yeah. They 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 were very good at sort of worming their way into places for a while. But they, I mean, so that's one side. They are like misanthropic division are like very anti-state. No one on the Russian far right scene really wants anything to do with them. Like there's bits of Russian neo-Nazi factions um like ethnotism and a few of these other ones that are tiny that are very anti-state and are like pro-ukraine at the war. yeah and they're they're very small but they do exist um there but the other side you've also got a guy who was associated with azov for a long time called uh sergey Kororki, known as botsman um, I think he's kind of running his own thing now in Ukraine. But he's one of those people that if I was working in Ukrainian 
counterintelligence, there's no way he wouldn't have been deported. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he attended the while he did his military service, he did it in intelligence. So GRU. Then when he was in, he moved to Minsk and attended the KGB Academy in Minsk before dropping out to join Russian National Unity, RNE, the Nazi group, and in 2000, assaulted several Belarusian opposition figures, including Andrei Sanikov. So, like, it's the classic thing of, like, okay, military intelligence background, security services, dodgy state-controlled Nazi group beating the shit out of opposition politicians. Oh, totally reliable. Let's let him... Do. Yeah, you'd be, like, getting the fuck out as quick as possible, wouldn't you? I and mean, then he was point. involved in protests calling for the deportation of Belarusian anarchists who'd fled to Ukraine after the 2020 crackdown. Fucking arsehole. Is he the guy with the big moustache? I think he's got a beard or, and a moustache. Uh, I'm not certain if it's just that on its own. Yeah. Like, big moustache guy might be Dmitry Korczynski, who used to command the Santa Maria Battalion. Um, he's he's always been, like, a like quite an obvious provocateur mm. in nationalist circles in Ukraine. He was the one who did the like the big stunt with the bulldozer with fireworks all over it in the Maidan in late 2013. Right, right, right. Um, and like, there's some crossover between the membership of his unit and very early stages of Azov as well. Mm. Yeah, like it's really in it's really like incestuous and I mean, you know, fascist groups. They're almost as bitchy and prone to splitting and merging as Trotskyists. They, they're constantly, like, folding these little grouper skills in and out all over the place. Um, but, like, I mean, like, even within the same groups, they don't necessarily align. So with the, the imperial movement links abroad, they had, they formed, they got that close alliance with Russian, with Nordic resistance movement. And then they also created, like, an agreement with the traditionalist workers' party, Matt Heimbach's lot in America. Yeah. Um, including Shevchuk going over there and posing in front of the White House with Matt Heimbach holding a Russian imperial flag. But in the Traditionalist Workers' Party Discord, the one that got leaked by Unicorn Right, it's amazing because you can actually see the internal reaction to the deal with Russian imperial movement. And one of the guys who's most vocal in his like opposition to it is this guy. I mean, I ended up working out who he was by tracing his handle across to Iron March and a few other places. And it's actually a guy called Leonid Mikhailov, who's a Finnish national of Russian origin. And he's also in Nordic resistance movement. And he was like, I fucking hate Russian imperial movement. You know, they're Russian nationalists, they're monarchists, that we they don't stand for anything. It's like, you're literally in two groups that are like have like got formal alliances with this group. He's the guy who actually hosted Slavros when he came to Finland and they did asset together. Oh, Slavros, the uh, the white nationalist who is not white, <laughs> and um, yeah, is is uh, he's the guy that well, you know, as bad as he was, he he's kind of um, in a way I would argue founded this whole siege culture neo Nazi type um, kind of renaissance over in the US and across the West. Yeah, he's. I mean, there's Iron so March, much right. work that needs to be done on Iron March and its oh, influence God, still. Right? Because it's all there. Like yeah. you can act, all of that material you can read and stuff, and you could spend years going through all the direct messages. Like you can see, you can pick out DM chains where it's like, wait, this is actually the first ever national action training camp being organised and things. It's fucking crazy the stuff in there. Yeah, and it's 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 actually like where a lot of these groups formed. Actually, even though in real life groups, they actually a lot of them formed online, right? Yeah, totally. It's it's, and it's interesting. Russian imperial movement are so weird in that they don't fit with that at all, ideologically or conceptually. But you'll still see. Like I remember sitting in like some like crappy Atomwaffen like fanboy Discord that I was in and there were people saying like oh i'm i mean I, I really want to i really wish i'd been around to join it and then people were like oh you could if, if you're in europe you could go to russia and you know go to partisan center right. like, this is because they, there's no crossover really in terms of siege like james mason ideology versus romanov like russian imperialism it's not 
really the same thing. I think a lot of it is they're just uh, attracted to um, extreme racism and militancy. And a lot of them, especially the West, don't actually give a shit what it is, the ideology exactly. is, what the connection is. It's just like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, exactly. They're seen as means to an end. And I think that's why the ideology is so flexible. It's the same thing. You know, we, we talked a bit about Dugan earlier, but you look at Dugan's political philosophy is completely incoherent over time. Oh, it's madness. Yeah. Yeah, he contradicts himself as well the longer he goes on. Yeah. And now he's, you know, appearing on Zagrad TV, the ultra-Orthodox, ultra-Christian, ragingly homophobic. So, and yet his he was really into, like, British industrial music and sort of Thelesma and, like, sex magic and stuff in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which um, I don't think is very, like, you know, you know, hardcore orthodox compatible. No, and he was also like, um, he was, uh, oh, what, what's that guy? Ah, uh, fuck the, uh, the guy who wears the mask, the British folklore guy. He's gay. He's a fascist. Oh, I can't remember his name. Doug, Doug Pierce. Yeah, from um, Death in June, right? Yeah, yeah. He was a Death in June guy as well, which doesn't really add up. Yeah, well, he he like said he went to the he went to a coil gig and was like, oh, I want to bring them to Russia, and you know we've got to this interview. And coil like they were they they did the first ever charity single single for the Terence Higgins Trust and stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. this is not it's not what you think. <laughs> it's not fascism. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's I mean, fascists are not ideologically coherent. Is one of the key their sort of their only consistent traits, obviously. Um, and in terms of um, the the groups now fighting in Ukraine, um, we already established that there's a lot of fascist Russian uh, groups fighting there. Now that this this kind of this new draft is coming on, um, are you seeing any like kind of talk amongst them about what's going to happen next? In terms of the 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 emergence of that Bars Thirteen group and the prominence of the National Bolshevik guy in there, that was like the most recent sort of manifestation. I think their their response to everything going south is. Interesting. So the Russian imperial movement guys are, oh, not all of them are Russian, by the way. Some of the ones I've seen there are Serbian, which, again, is not that surprising when you think mm. of the history of the nationalist groups in both those countries. But they are very much like, yes, we needed the mobilization all along. This is what should have happened. It's only right. been delayed because of domestic weakness. Um, on the sort of, on the sort of Russian like, Bolshevik start national Bolshevik guys. I think they're a bit more sort of they're still recruiting quite publicly. They've got these contact forms on the contact here and stuff, and like you know, there's an address in Rostov on Don that you can go to where they're trying to recruit. So they are like they are still they are in they are in favor of um they're in favor of mobilization because they think everyone should have gone to the front already. Yeah. Um I, I, and again, with like the it's it is so weird that the national Bolsheviks have like gone with this. I mean, they did in twenty fourteen. It's not weird that they're in this now, but it's amazing to think of the transformation. I think this is one of the effects on the domestic opposition that Putin like achieved with the whole war in Ukraine in the first place. Back in two thousand and six through two thousand and eleven, the national Bolsheviks under Edward Lomonov used to like have joint protests alongside people like Kasparov and Nimtsov and all of these Russian liberal oppositionists and centre-right lot against Putin under the Strategy 31 thing. Same with Sergei Udaltsov from the left front. They're not pro-Putin, but Udaltsov, after he did his time in prison, came out and was suddenly like, I love the war in Donbass because we're going to rebuild the Soviet Union. Right, right, yeah. Limonov loved it because... He loved war. He loves, yeah, he just loves death and misery, basically. Yeah, like, you know, like you alluded to earlier, and in case anyone's not seen it, yeah, he is on video. I think it's in the Serbian epics documentary by the BBC, just firing a Dushka into Sarajevo. He's just an enthusiast for war and also for Russian greatness. So they like, they're all in favor of the war in spite of Putin. Mm. But it is a, it's just amazing that what Putin was like, what the Kremlin did through the war in Ukraine from 2014, was split off a big chunk of their domestic opposition by being able to split them into camps of traitors and patriots. It's quite a smart move, really, in that sense, especially yeah. if you want to mobilise people. Yeah, so it's actually, 
I think it's worked quite well in kind of splitting that up into those chunks. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that's... I've not seen some of the, like, really weird, flaky aspects of the Russian far-right groups that there were in 2014 or so. Like, do you remember a group called Team Vikanes? Yes, I do, actually. Um, Oh, God, what is it? What is it they got known for online? They did something on, like, Twitter or something, or Telegram. They did something... There was an American... She called herself a freelance journalist. I think she was using a pseudonym of Cat Argo. Right. And she used to post on Twitter a bit as like a Red Rover. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is what I'm thinking, yeah. She did like a documentary series on them, but eventually seemed to shack up with one of them. Yeah. And they were like openly like insanely racist, but they were all foreign, if I remember yeah. correctly. They were Brazilians, French guys. Um and obviously they were named after Varg Vikanes from Burzum. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she actually ended up going to Iraq with the French Nazi from it, uh, Guillaume Cuvelle, who used to do security for the Front National. And they started some like dodgy combat medic u- volunteer unit that got into fights with the Kurds there. Yeah. Because um, they were, you know, trying to chase glory and stuff and actually being drunken assholes and causing yeah. loads of trouble. I've kept you for a while. Is, is there anything else you kind of want to go over before we go? Just thinking. I mean, so just to recap right now, let me just think what we've got. So we've got Russian national. We've got the Drugaya Rossiya people, the national Bolsheviks, like the leader of the Bars 13 one. They're fighting in Liman, or they've just pulled out of it. We've got Russian imperial movement who were present in Izium, um, and we've got Rusic. I don't know exactly where they are right now. Um, I think that's most of it. Like we, There's a million tons we could go into on the connections with the far right, terrorist attacks, fucking like subversion, German politics and stuff and all that sort of stuff. But I think that would be like a very big episode in its own right if we were to go down that road. Well, let's work out another one to do another time about it all. Yeah, I mean, I'm always happy. I mean, like... There's stuff I wish I could talk about as well that I've done as research that's still like awaiting clearance for like some documents to be like allowed to use as well in public and stuff mm. that I've got from some sources. Like mm. there's, yeah, like partisan center is interesting. Um, and like there's definitely been some interesting foreigners attending it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, but not Caleb Cole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I think. Yeah, that's like a good overview of the Russian groups that are fighting there right now. The only other ones that were there in 2014, 2015 that aren't so, that aren't so visible now because they've kind of declined a lot is Russian National Unity. And they were going around with fucking tanks with Orthodox icons on them and stuff because they, they ditched the swastikas for the Orthodox iconography. Mm. Um, but no, I think... I'm just doing a last check of any of the notes I had before I did the call. I don't think there's anything that I need to add in in terms of that won't just like take it down an enormous sidetrack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's pretty comprehensive. Oh, one other little... No, I don't know if you want to use this for this, but like, you know, it's all right. But, you know, I said Dennis Gariev, the guy who runs Partisan Centre. Yeah. And, oh, we hate the government. He's also the former director of like a fucking hardware or stationary company that was a supplier to the fsb jesus christ and you can see that in the russian corporate records website they've got like a state contract with the fsb the the irony here is that the country that says they're denazifying ukraine russia their far right has actually um more connections to the government from what i can see than the far right in ukraine and you know, but allegedly Russia are the ones denazifying the place. Yeah, and to reiterate, like the entire founding nature of the Donetsk People's Republic, with all of its Soviet imagery, was entirely dominated by open, like documented fascists. It's there's no hiding any of these connections, and also it's, remember now though, look at what's happening politically in Russia. The whole Z movement is quite overtly fascist in its own right. We've got this veneration of a symbol that doesn't signify anything yeah. and scream it, you know, fucking... Holy war and all that shit. 
yeah, screaming glee on Red Square yeah. about fighting the Satanists and the yeah. sort of globalists who are going to turn our children gay or trans. It's yeah. just... Bro, that has been a thing. Like, when I was in the DNR, there was some, like, Russian soldiers there, like, well, like a Russian colonel or whatever the fuck he was, um, pretending that, you know, oh... Actually, I think he was pretty barefaced. I think he was like, yeah, fuck it, I'm Russian, I don't give a fuck, like, I'm from Russia, whatever. He had Russian plates, everything. Anyway... And they were saying like, oh, these these are some reporters from Europe. We kind of went in kind of sneaky. We did well. We didn't sneak. We just said, look, we want to tell the truth, and that was that. So they thought, oh yeah, that means they're on our side. But we didn't, you know, we did tell the truth, and the truth is, it was a totalitarian hellhole. Um, but anyway, we we went in, and they were like, oh, this is some reporters from Europe, and he was like, oh God, how do you live in Europe with so many gay people? And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, I just kind of was like, oh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's <laughs> it's Europe. You know what it is? Like, we just kind of tried to, like, you know, shift off the conversation because, you know, I don't want to end up in a gulag. But, um, yeah, it's crazy. Like, they were obsessed with, like, I mean, yeah, the so-called, you know, the, the kind of anti-fascist of the soviet dnr um they were all obsessed with like really right-wing ideologies and oh my god there's so many immigrants in europe oh there's gay people everywhere like oh I, we feel bad for you you know like you should live in the dnr i was like no i think i'm good yeah, it's very fucking weird man yeah well look at the so when they had this like completely fucking bogus referendum at gunpoint in yeah. the occupied areas the politicians they brought over, well, I say politicians, they barely count, as electoral observers. Like, previously, they've always had people from the Front National or the Austrian Freedom Party, AFD, um, that kind of lot. This time, they couldn't really get any MEPs or anything, but they did get a guy called Emmanuel Leroy, who is a raging neo-Nazi, also from that same Kress scene as Alain de Benoit, used to be an advisor to Le Pen, um, he runs like a bogus charity called Urgence Enfant du Caine with a guy from Bloc Identitaire, um, did the White Forum with David Duke in Russia and stuff, like, yeah, proper Nazis. Proper Nazis, yeah. Yeah, and the other guy was this guy, Christoph Hörstel, who is the leader of this micro party in Germany called Neue Mitte, which is like anti-vax, anti-Semitic conspiracy theory stuff. It's, it's almost his, his telegram stuff is like very Q, but maybe without the explicit Q stuff. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's the level of support they've got. Everyone that they bring in to be like, look, we're a legitimate place. They're, they're a fascist or a conspiracy theorist. And that's what they're using to legitimate these claims to the territory as well. It's fascinating. And it's when you break it down like this, uh, it's very ironic, actually, the so-called fucking special operation. It's a fascist land grab being perpetrated with like a mixture of conscripts and fascist volunteers. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, there's not really any way, other way around it. No. Um, all right, mate. Um, I won't keep you any longer. Um, if people want to, you know, look at your research, get in touch with you, whatever, where's the best place? I don't really tweet that much. I do. I'm a it's investigator with Center for Information Resilience. Mm. Um, we run the Myanmar Witness uh, and Eyes on Russia and Afghan Witness programs. Um, so most of my work comes out through there, um, sort of mainly war crime investigation work. Um, I do have a Twitter, which is just Pierre Vo, but I very rarely tweet anymore. Mm. Um, just not really yeah so if, if i publish anything i'll put it on there but i'm not really doing any back and forth on there but it's please feel free to get in touch with me if you've got any questions or interest um and your surname is spelled well i'll just spell the whole thing so the twitter is p-i-e-r-r-e-v-a-u-x yeah and apologies i do tend to most most of the stuff i'll be there is just resharing stuff in russian yeah but there'll there'll be occasional things um, we've got a report coming out soon on the Kramatorsk railway station strike um, on how that was perpetrated with a, by Russian ballistic missiles, and we trace it back with a satellite imagery to the launch site. Yeah. Um, so it's that that kind of work mainly. This far right investigation stuff is uh, I've done it in all my sort of various jobs and like journalism, but it's kind of like my personal hobby horse of interest is link is like transnational fascist links. 
So, yeah, hopefully there'll be something proper on this in the future. All right, mate. Thanks very much. Really appreciate that. That was very, very informative. Thanks, man. It's really, really pleased to have you on. That was Pierre Vo speaking about the far right fascist elements of the Russian Kremlin invasion of Ukraine. I think this is a really important episode and I think what Pierre does is really, really good. Out of all the far right researchers, there are many online, it's turned into a bit of a cottage industry and circle jerking competition and there are a lot of very incompetent people doing it. Pierre is certainly not one of them. He is always on point. Been speaking to him for a long time. He's very, very good at what he does. So please do um, check out his work. Um, Twitter, like we said, at Pierre Vo, and you can find all of the uh, information there. If you like what we're doing here at Popular Front, you like this kind of journalism, please do consider supporting us at patreon.com slash popular front. We are grassroots, completely independent. We refuse any corporate investment um and the way we keep moving forward is we sell our bonus content on the patreon subscription service or you can buy our merchandise at popularfront.shop that keeps us moving forward believe it or not we're funding documentaries with t-shirts and stuff like that um right now the pre-order for the third issue of the popular front zine is available um it will only be available for a couple more days we've sold a ton of them now um on the pre-order if you want one you're going to have to um, get it now quick because we won't be doing it anymore. Um, I know people were selling some issues on eBay of like issue one and issue two, but they were hiking the price up. So if you want to get it proper, um, get it now quickly on the pre-order, popularfront.shop. We've got new t-shirts, a uh, new hat as well on there as well, bucket hat, which everyone was asking me to do. So yeah, check that out, popularfront.shop or subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash popularfront. Thank you to our sponsors for this episode. Uh, they are Oracle Coffee Shop in Portland, Oregon, USA. Uh, Oracle Coffee Shop is an independent coffee business selling only fair trade products. See them at 3875 Southwest Bond Avenue, 97239. And now if you go there and tell them, hey, um, you know, Popular Front sent me, you will get a discount on your order. I am told, not sure how much it is, I forgot, but yeah, tell them that we sent you. Um, also, thank you to Grindcore House, a pair of independent coffee shops in Philadelphia, USA. One in South, one in West. Find them on socials at Grindcore House. Very good people. Check them out. Uh, also, thank you to Propagandopolis, an outlet selling and writing about historical conflict propaganda from around the world by prints at Propagandopolis.com. Use a promo code POPULARFRONT10 for 10% off. Uh, we have a new sponsor for this episode. Um, it is Joker Sabian. Well, it's Joker Sabian's new book. Joker Sabian is a great writer, a very nice lad. We had him on the podcast recently. Um, he's got a new book out now. It's called The Frontier Corps. Um, it's a military sci fi story about when the lowest rungs of society are burdened with the expansion of an empire. It's available now for free if you've got a Kindle or anywhere where you get books. Check that out. Frontier the sorry the frontier core by joe kasabian that's k-a-s-s-a-b-i-a-n um if you like sci-fi you'll like this i personally really fucking like sci-fi so um i've got a copy um it looks good yeah check him out frontier core by joe kasabian if you want to follow us on social media instagram at popular.front uh twitter at popularfront underscore and tiktok ccp hell app as opposed to instagram being the us zoc hell app but anyway tiktok it's at popular dot front um if you want to um see our kind of website where there's all information everything like that popularfront.co and for all links to everything it's popularfront.cc i know yeah why have we got loads of different urls for stuff I don't fucking know because we do. And if you wanna, if you wanna look at our YouTube, you can go to popularfront.tv. No joke. Um, it will redirect you to youtube.com/popularfront. To be honest, right now, like our YouTube is one of the most important things for us because we're deeply censored by um, YouTube. We've gone through everything. A guy from YouTube even 
tried to help us it is what it is but yeah we're being censored by them um it's very annoying a lot of our content is behind age restriction um things and offensive content things um yeah it's it's just awful to be honest like to go out to the front line or wherever to a dangerous place um do all this off your own back and then be like oh the tech overlords have decided that it's not advertiser friendly so therefore they're gonna make it extremely hard for anyone to view it uh it's it's soul destroying <laughs> <laughs> on many levels i'll be honest with you but fuck it we keep moving forward um so yeah please do if you can i guess my point is share our documentaries youtube.com slash popular front if you can share that if you have a big platform small platform whatever it's all good if you can just share our stuff we really appreciate it because the things that were put in place to help us share our stuff are working against us i.e instagram we're constantly censored on there they refuse to verify us because you know if you're verified you're above most of the rules um twitter same thing i mean you get places like you you get you get certain places that all of a sudden they get you know verified on every level it's because they're suckling on the teeth of a state department or some advertising agency we don't do that so yeah anyway <laughs> bitching and moaning over but please do share our stuff um you see it all at popularfront.cc links to all our stuff um music in this episode the intro was by home and the outro was by Sam Black. You can hear Sam Black's music at samblackpf.com. Um, okay, thank you very much to the higher tier Patreons. Uh, we've got quite a lot now. Really, really appreciate all of this. Um, they are Rohan Irvine, Ryan Barbadillo, VS, Brian R, Evan Pank, Bradley Hope, Wizard Actual, Claire Hofbauer, Chongus Bongwater, Elijah Finley, Siddhartha O, Cameron Collins, Q Loves Cake Farts, Nicholas Blomberg, Matthew Diff Diffley, Jane Millerchip, Claire, Liana, Sean, Christianovich, NTHG, uh, Arturo Raphael Macias, I hope I've said that right mate, let me know if I, I didn't, uh, Ethan Zwick, Champagne Anarchist, Elise Middlefart, David McManus, Tom Petrie, James Leons, Lisa Milgram, Bradley Davies, No Dogs, No Hamsters, Brendan Crave, B, Drift, RX, Tiki Lover, Ben Marshall, Dallas Dunn, Shikha Gupta, LD50 Seattle, the hardcore band, check them out, very cool lads, uh, K Clayter Vulcan, Bethany Swoveland, Adam H, Derivative Fool, Ball of Water, Larson8669, uh, Ivan Julien, Bjorn Kirsten, Diamond Steen, uh, Michael O'Connor, Disgrunt, Jack Doherty, Nicholas Butter, JD, Jav, Ian Froese, James Cully, Tynan Daly, Ethan, Shanklin the Painter, Fitz Madrid, Ed Coulthard, Coulthard D San, Mike Barone, Ben, Scott Hopton, Liam Williams, Chris Cusimano, DZA, Giorgio Arani, DR, Amy R, Rubicon, Frank Austin, Amelia Me, Christina Rivetti, Freya Northman, Noah, Andrew Hurley, Vida Provost, Brian McLaughlin, Tom Lochrin, Young Wasabi, Tony Bin, Adam Berg Snyder, JL, Stephen Davila, Dan Donham, Fletcher, Chad Walker, Diana Govanek, Lawrence Abrahams, Peter McCormack from What Bitcoin Did, Christopher Martin, Ryan Sandercock, and Moritz Zumbul. Thank you all so much. Um, most of these people have been with us for so long on a higher tier. It's mad to me like that everyone supports like that. Really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, a lot more is coming in 2023. I know we're not that close to it, but we have so many plans. Very much looking forward to it. So thank you all so much for continuing uh, to support. Like I said, um, if anyone wants to support us, if anyone wants to keep us going, um, you can go to patreon.com slash popular front or popularfront.co slash support.